All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Dr. Elise Cortez, who is in Dallas, Texas. How are you doing, Elise? Awesome, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, Lise is a purpose engagement catalyst, speaker, consultant, researcher, published author, and radio show podcast host, as we said, based in Dallas. So um, obviously extremely busy, uh, but you have just or you are bringing out a new book. I think it releases on November 17th, if I'm correct. Correct. A, a book called Purpose Ignited. And that is how inspiring leaders unleash passion and elevate cause. And okay, so you have in this book uh, that's coming out, you have a, a seven point philosophy of work to inspire yourself and others. Can you just talk about where this came from in the first place and how you came up with this uh, seven point philosophy? Absolutely. Um, so what happened along the way, John, is yours truly needed a, a mighty awakening. And so um, I, everything that's in the book is really my, uh, an, a, a, an indication of my own journey, what it took for me to awaken to my passion, inspiration, and purpose. And so I really helped listeners or, and readers, because it's going to be on both, to understand what it took for me to do all this. And so it's kind of my own recipe, if you will, for awakening. That's, that's fantastic. And obviously, like mighty awakenings are very underrated. So hopefully it'll encourage people, more people to have them. So they talk us through um, your, I mean, you had your awakening, talk us through that, but also then how you managed to parse it into a, an actual process. Okay, so it's a fun process. So let me back up mm -hmm. by saying that, you know, I really, I will tell you, John, for me, that I really discovered really my purpose when I was 49 years old in 2014. I really had a pretty good idea of where I was going. I was very much following the internal divining rod, and it was taking me where I needed to, to go. And that is really where my research around meaning and work coalesced into the 15 modes of engagement. Um, I was doing consulting from that, from that work. Um, I was... Uh, about to go to India to go present my, my research at a business conference and spend three weeks there, which was life-changing. And then Voice America called me to do my radio show. So it was all connected, right? I mean, it was all like the stars were aligning. It was like almost ah, like that, mm -hmm. right? And um, so it was it was there for me. And, and then I sort of, just, when I came back from India, I was like kind of lost, not sure how to make all that work in the world. I knew who I was and what I was supposed to be doing, but I didn't quite know how to actualize it how to operationalize it. So a lot of 2015 was getting the radio show kicked off and trying kind of fumbling. And then I went through my divorce and spent a couple of years working for another management consultancy company. So that for me was an important part of the journey, John, in the sense that I was supposed to come to that company. I firmly believe that and I was supposed to leave. So mm -hmm. how this book came to be is in July of 2018, um, I separated from the, from the other company and said, I am going to jump back out on my own as I had been for 15 years prior. And this time I'm going to focus on meaning and purpose. And right. to honor this journey, I'm going to do three things by the last six months of 2018. One, I'm going to start my nonprofit, which I did. Two, I'm going to create my own leadership program. I did, vitally inspired. And three, I'm going to draft this book. So when I, when I drafted it, John, I was in that place in life where I was like so grateful that I got to live my purpose and I was honoring it. And so I, I mm -hmm. wrote this really flowery expose of what this was supposed to be. And <laughs> if I look back on it now, John, and it's so laughable, um, I had the best of intentions, but that's how it began. And then what happened from there is I refined it. Um, but I very much took from what did I what did I learn from all these years mm -hmm. of consulting? What did I learn from these years of hosting working on purpose radio? Uh, what did I learn from my research? And that is really the result that's in this book today. Yeah, and that's a that's such a great story. And I think uh, I think lots of people, if they looked back in the way you just did, would probably discover that they have lots and lots of fantastic experiences and knowledge to draw upon. That, uh, you know, and I always think it's, it's unfortunate. I think that many people miss out on that and they think they don't know as much as they actually do or they think they don't have as much to offer as they actually do. I completely agree with you. And I think we, we absolutely, every single one of us knows something really, really precious. 
the effort, the real work is, is finding a way to convey that, articulate that so somebody mm -hmm. else can understand it. And then two, put it in such a way that they can do something about it and learn it and, and fold it into their person or organization. So let's talk a little bit about purpose, right? Because I do think that um, it's, it's talked about a lot. You hear it thrown around an awful lot now. You know, people talk about purpose-driven organizations, purpose-driven lives, and all of that kind of thing. And I'm not sure that everybody has a clear definition of it. I think it kind of means different things to different people. But when you talk about purpose, what do you mean? I appreciate that question so much because, you know, I have seen, I've taken pictures of this as I travel. Um, food on purpose tires on purpose. I'm like, uh, no, you're missing it. So my, the way I orient that, let me, and I, I think it would be good to talk about actually three terms, purpose, meaning, and identity, but purpose, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost in my world is a choice. It's a path. And, and you step on that with the idea being that you are, you're honoring your, your core person, the core, the person you really are at your core without any masks, without any, any pretense. It's just who you are and frankly, who you're meant to be. So I love Zach Mercurio's definition best is, he says, uh, purpose is your, your unique reason for being that betters the world. That's the best definition that I've ever heard. Thank you, Zach. Um, really quick, meaning, what's meaning? It's meaning is that that which holds significance for you. It what registers as important or valuable to you. And it's, it's registered on the, on the, lim in the limbic brain alongside emotions and memories. And so it has an emotional component to you, to it. That's why it's so significant and important. And that's why it feels the way that it does. Um, and that's why it has energy and motivation to it. That's why it's so important. And identity, um, which is my second chapter after meaning, uh, is really that whole that whole notion of being being consumed with who am I and who can and should I become? So it's a lifelong identity project that we have for ourselves, which can, for a lot of us, unfold into and through purpose. Yeah, and uh, let's um, let's just talk through a couple of those. For for instance, um, let's go back to choice. You say choice. Um, it's the path. It's it's who you are, or who you should be, or who you're meant to be. Um, that's, that can be very difficult for people, right? People don't, uh, I, and this is the thing that often fascinates me, is people don't like making choices, right? People like to keep all of their options open and maybe kind of float through things a little bit. And not very many people make a very definitive choice about this is the path that I want to be in, or this is who I am, or this is who I want to be. So when you, when you talk to people or, or in your book, how do you help people to actually make make active choices as opposed to let life happen to them? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, two things I'm going to say to that, John. Love your questions, by the way. Clearly, you are a deep thinker, and I love talking to people like you. Um, so the first thing is, ideally, people have to have some sort of semblance of discomfort or something that they're, that they're, they're, they're wanting differently in their lives. Um, whether that takes the form of what we have been calling a midlife crisis or whatever that might mm -hmm. be, or just things are just not they're not fulfilled in life. They're not fulfilled at work. That, that's a good place to start from, to start to peruse that path. Um, as you say, people don't want to make the choices. They don't want to do the work because it's really hard work and it's scary and it's, you're jumping into the unknown. So that's already, there's just a whole lot of danger with that. Um, but that if you're uncomfortable enough, you're willing to jump off the cliff like I was. So you got it. Right. If you can get to that point, that's great. Now, if you can't get to that point, one of the things that we as logotherapists employ is this, this tool called myutic questioning. And it's really, it's kind of like the element of surprise with a provocative question, John. You know, it's like, you know, well, how long, John, do you plan on living before you actually chop that left arm off to make it stop hurting? Right. It's a question like that, you know? And it's the kind of questions that's, that's designed in the, it's gotta be exactly in the moment and, and not planned or, or predetermined, but just e evoked from the moment that served from the vantage point of, I'm trying to help you discover and awaken to yourself and position well, those questions can be incredibly eye-opening to, okay, I'm ready to make a change. What do I have to do here? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think that's, the, that's great because I think people do lack a, a process for doing it. So something like that, I think is, could be extremely, um, beneficial and you said something there that just struck me it's it's one of the things I think that holds people back a lot of the time is that they are doing things that they think are expected of them 
Mm -hmm. Right. So, and and they don't even know where this expectation is coming from. Maybe it's it, maybe they think it's a societal expectation. Maybe they think it's their family expectation. Um, but that becomes a very com not a convenient, but that becomes a way of of avoiding making big changes or even thinking about big changes because you're sort of saying I'm doing what's expected of me. Yes, and now you're really getting to something very powerful, John. So beyond choice, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, beyond choice is, is I'm going to get to meaning again, because meaning is such mm -hmm. an important thing. Um, and, and so because people, all of us tend to do things that we think are expected of us, the, in fact, that's kind of like the roles that we play, which is also part of our identity. Um, and it's being part of a society and doing what we think people expect of us to be, to be accepted and to be desired and wanted. And those are all part of being part of a clan as, in a society. And that's mm -hmm. important. Where it gets really, really interesting is when we start to take off those accumulated masks um, and, and, and in those new situations and we encounter an experience uh, or, or a person that allows us to see something about ourselves that is unique or different or special. That is where meaning, that's a circumstance where meaning is actually registered. And that's when we can start to really make profound differences in our lives because we get access to that like almost, you know, profound elemental source, which is ourself. And, and then we can start to make choices totally differently. Yeah, no, I know. I love what you just said there, because I do think that. Um, it is when you take off those masks or it's, it's in a very personal situation or something that it's often when somebody uncovers something about you, as you say, which is the essence of who you are. But unfortunately, um, getting that out into the broader world seems to be such a huge challenge for most people is that whole thing about actually being their authentic self, bringing that true essence forward, because it, we very quickly put the masks back on. That's terrifying for all of us, right? It's like standing naked in front of a whole crowd of people going, hey, so how do I look? Um, <laughs> am I going to get booed off stage? Um, it's terribly terrifying, right? Of course. And, and so, but what I'm finding though, John, I can't even tell you, there's definitely a, a, a coalition of, of rising voices that more and more people are caring and working on this. I, I meet transformational experts from all over the world. Um, I'm working with people who want to start an energy institute, a global energy institute, not as in power, as in electricity, but sure. human, human energy, mm -hmm. right? And so I really see, and I, I think we can also sort of credit the pandemic to this, is I mm -hmm. think people are reaching for something more, for something higher, for something more, more special, more precious for themselves. And I think that in so doing, they are willing to go past those discomfort boundaries, yeah, and, and I would agree with you. And I think that, and I think that's a byproduct of the pandemic. Maybe it, one that we'll look back in and say, okay, it was it was terrible and all the damage it did. But however, like anything else, um, there was something renewable, something renewable there. And I think maybe what you're talking about is, you know, there's a lot more time for self reflection in many ways. And and if you think about it, where were we pre? pandemic it's like the world was just getting so fast and so crazy and social media and technology and people are so consumed that when you strip away a little bit of this stuff i think people maybe are finding that there is a void there is some void there oh i think that's so beautifully said john i completely agree in fact so in in logotherapy we talk about the that humankind's principal concern in life is meaning it's our principal motivation it's what we're we're all looking for and and that there's three sources of meaning um there are the what we our creations what we give of the world to world for to of ourselves experiences encounters and then the attitude that we take especially when we encounter things we cannot change um and so what we know what we find in in logotherapy is that it, it is the existential vacuum the lack of meaning that causes the, the most suffering in the world. And, and, and what we do to try to cover that up usually is we run, we run faster, we work harder, we consume more drugs, alcohol, whatever else it might be to numb away that horrible feeling. But you're right, I believe the pandemic has, has even further surfaced for a lot of people. Um, oh, I actually don't like the work that I'm doing. It's not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, the person I've been living with for 20 years, wow, what, how did I miss that, right? <laughs> so people are both coming together and going apart and they're yeah. making choices differently because I, I do believe the existential vacuum and that lack of meaning is surfacing so writ large that they can't avoid it anymore. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think it has been accentuated by, as I said, by 
the by social media and all of this and by this kind of um, superficial culture that that sprung up and I think you know people threw them have thrown themselves headlong into it and started measuring you know by likes and shares and everything and then suddenly realized I think there's a there's a I think there's an awakening or a, a realization for a lot of people that this is this is not a good thing. It's not real, and the things that matter are right in front of your nose and surrounding you, probably like three or four feet in each direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just over the last couple of days had a, a, an, an insight that I don't know if it's right or not, but I'm going to go with it anyway. I've had enough people on my radio show lately talking as speaking from the vantage point of being futurists and technologists, mm -hmm. talking about how technology really allows us human beings to elevate ourselves. And when we work together with technology that we are actually um, brought to a higher level of contribution and function because of technology. And I buy that. Now, I actually believe that the pandemic has done the same thing for us. We, we have been mm -hmm. forced to confront ourselves that which we are and we realize, oh, the enemy is us. <laughs> We're <laughs> the one that's <laughs> causing all these problems in the world and with, with each other. And I think it's really helped elevate our thinking um, and our desires and what we want from ourselves and from each other uh, and in the world. And therefore, it is elevating us as a, as in, in terms of our consciousness and, and as a society and as humanity. So, and I think that's why people can better recognize this this emptiness, this this meaning vacuum. Yeah, and I love what you said about uh, the technology and the elevation, because I 100% agree that is the role that technology should play. And it should be something that helps to elevate our thinking, helps to elevate the way we operate. I think on the flip side, that if there, if, if there are, and there are technologies who actually dumb everything down and, and um, push it all down, you know, those are the things that people should start to move away from and, and look at technology exactly in the way you talked about it. If this is not elevating, if this is not improving how I can operate as a human being in the world, well, then I've got to question whether this is a good technology. Yeah, and I, I think what's also happening for people right now is that we're recognizing just how quickly, how much we have had to grow and change and evolve and react and respond and be agile mm -hmm. in this pandemic. And it's been exhausting for a lot of us, right? Because that's a lot of work to work that hard in response. Um, but I think it also is really mirroring what we need to do on the technology side to stay as partners with technology and yeah. not be overrun by it. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. And just coming back to the piece about identity, because I do think that this is probably something that a lot of people have struggled with, um, particularly um, during the pandemic. If you think about a lot of people's identity often revolves around what they do. And you know, so, you know, maybe you get into the car in the morning and you go into the office and, you know, you're in your office and that's who you are and all of the things. And suddenly all of that has been taken away, right? And you're sitting at home and you're just like everybody else. And I think maybe there's a there maybe this is one of the first times that there's been a collective challenging of our perceived identities. Mm. Ooh, this is so yummy. Okay, so um so as somebody who reveres the world of work, right? I think work is such a noble part of our lives. It's such, a, mm -hmm. such an important part of the way we spend our time, the way we steward our lives. And it's a contribution of our person to the world that I, I get a, a, a little bit um, leery of talking about identity at work because I've studied it for years and I, and I champion mm -hmm. it. However, I think that there's an opportunity for those of us that if we find ourselves um, you know, unmoored because maybe we've lost our job in, in this economy or whatever, and our identity has, has really been anchored in, in that job, we've missed the opportunity to recognize what purpose really is. Purpose is always about serving other people. It's not about what we get. And I'll tell you from my own experience, uh, serving your own purpose isn't always convenient. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, if we, are, we feel like we've lost our moorings because we've lost our job, and that's, that's a big part of our identity, I think we just have an opportunity to raise our gaze a little bit and go, hold on, who, who really have we been serving all of this time? Is it, is it, if it's just about the prestige of the role, the large paycheck, and the people who report to you, you've missed an opportunity to really look at how can you really be of service in your life toward your purpose. And that is always going to be in service of other people. And, and when you do that, John, right, if you lose that whole worrisome aspect of I no longer have my identity because I lost my job, because it's not mm -hmm. about the job. The job is just a way to express part of who you are, but it's not all of you and it's not your purpose 
or it's just a way for you to express it. So therefore you haven't lost yourself. Yeah. And I think even for, um, and even for people, not, not just people who've lost their jobs, but people who have maybe been working virtually and remotely for the first time. Um, I do think there is a byproduct of that as well, where people have realized that in order to operate and, and work and connect that you have to work a little bit harder at your communications, perhaps a little bit harder than you would if you were all in a physical building. And I think that's actually uncovering the fact that maybe the connections that you thought you had with the people that you operated alongside of every day in a physical building, maybe not as strong as you actually thought they were. And now when you're forced to develop these virtually, you actually find out a lot more about the people around you and actually connect on, on quite a different level, which is, it, which is almost counterintuitive to what most people would think. That's a beautiful insight, John. I would, I, I would venture to put forth that a lot of us have, have taken um, advantage of, or uh, not taken advantage of, but um, not taken in full consideration just how much work it is to communicate well, and that when we are actually in a physical environment, a lot of communication happens without words. Mm -hmm. And so we, we rest on that, right? We rest on those laurels. And now we don't have those cues anymore. So you're right, we have to work harder. And that's another reason why people feel so exhausted and burnt out in this environment, because it is a lot more work. And we all are all learning new things, right? And some people are like, I've had enough, you know, stop the yeah. learning train, just, you know, make it stop and, or make it derail or something. And, and I understand that, right? And, and so, yeah, it's a lot more work to be made understood and to communicate um, effectively and meaningfully with somebody in a virtual environment, no question. Yeah. And, and maybe as, you know, as we come to the end here, I just think there's, um, you know, your book and, and what you're talking about I really do feel like the time. This is the right time. I think the, the everything is in aligning right now. As you alluded to earlier, I think there's a consciousness or energy in the world where people are kind of like, I want to get off the superficial. I want to get off the chaotic and crazy. I want to actually find meaning and purpose in my life, and even meaning and purpose even in 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 within the confines of my family or my whatever it is even on whatever level you're looking for. But I do think there is, there's something happening out there. And I think maybe this, maybe we'll look back on this as some kind of reset button. I absolutely was saying that from the very get go. I think it is a reset button. It was a necessary global earth saying, Hey, I told you guys, we, you know, we've, we, we've got a really powerful force here. You got to pay attention to it. And I know a lot of us are resistant to that. And I understand that, but I, I wrote the book, John, because it, it's really six ingredients of how to turn people on from the inside out and really mm -hmm. get them present to their meaning, their passion, their inspiration, and purpose. And then once they get present to that, it's I always like to think about it as you're on the helicopter pad and you're inside the helicopter and they're, they're turning on all the engines and everything's starting to take off and rev. You can just feel all that energy going, right? Mm -hmm. That's you in the first part of the book, right? And then you can just feel it psst, take off, right? And so then now what it's a matter of, you become that inspirational leader that becomes the ripple in the world. So you now then turn on people to their passion, their inspiration, their purpose, who do the same for everyone else they encounter. Now all of a sudden we have all these unleashed dynamic beings working from their purpose in the world who are also then championing greater cause through their organizations. Now we've really done something pretty fantastic just by starting to turn on one person. That's why I wrote the book because I know that one person can make a difference. Yeah, and and I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it is, it is something that uh, um, I often talk about is that at the end of the day, and it, it, we have a classic example right now because we're in the middle of an election and that here, right, is, um, you know, we see like people on social media and other platforms like shouting at each other, right, just, and, and, and I would say is like, I don't know anybody whose mind has ever been changed by somebody shouting at them and telling them that they're stupid. It's, right. it, it, we're not, as humans, it doesn't really work. However, what does work? Role models, where you see people living out, um, you know, you see somebody and you think, wow, that person's very impressive, the way they live their life, the way they comport themselves and all of that. That has such a, that has such a huge impact. And exactly what you're saying, it just takes one person at a time to influence those around them and then another person, another person, and suddenly you have the positive change that you're looking for. It doesn't come from sitting, um, sitting, uh, you know, with a beer pontificating on the world's problems or whatever. That doesn't change anything. But living 
living it out and influencing people by your actions and how you comport yourself is what really brings change. Completely agree. And I certainly stand to be a, a force that showcases those voices, is a voice and brings more of them together for sure. Yeah, it's fantastic. Listen, uh, Dr. Elise Cortez, uh, Purpose Ignited, How Inspiring Leaders Unleash Passion and Elevate Cause. It is available. It, it's published on November 17th uh, coming up. It is uh, available on Amazon and all good bookstores. So I would really uh, encourage people to check it out. I think this is a fantastic, the other thing, I think this is a fantastic time to invest in yourself. To yeah, be I, honest. I don't think agree. you're going to, I don't think you're going to get a better chance than this. So I would encourage you to check out Elise's book. Um, all of Lisa's information plus the book will be below this video, so easy to get at. Um, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So I like to really position myself first and foremost as, as a management consultant focused on meaning and purpose. And as you say, you said before, I'm an author, I'm a radio show host, I'm a social scientist, I'm a logotherapist. But I also launched a, a, an e-learning platform called Gusto Now, which really allows me to also do all of that, also in Spanish and Portuguese. I came from spending three years in Spain and, and Brazil, and that gave me so much of myself and my person and my zest for life and, and where I really got and learned about passion. So I wanted to be able to bring that back into the world. So I would say that's the best way to describe me in a nutshell. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.